are two questions, uh, they're general questions for all of you. Uh, how can the vertical transportation be used for fire and life safety? As the buildings are, as you all know, getting taller. Coming down is becoming a problem. Uh, and second question is these double deck elevators, can they be also destination dispatched? Or destination dispatch system be used for that? Those are the two questions. Thank you. So maybe the uh, first question I would defer to Mr. McCall because I think he has some discussion coming up this afternoon on that. Uh, <laughs> No, that's a fair question. Well, actually, my presentation is all about evacuation. Well, then I will. Using then we, we can wait. We'll wait. We'll wait. Forget that. Uh, in regards to the second question, if I may, for the, my colleagues, I think I can answer that all of the companies um, that offer double deck today that are sitting here in the room are, are offering with destination dispatch based systems. Um, yes, I just wonder could you explain the pros and cons of uh, double deck versus twin car? I, I think the reality is, as we've shown in CMA Tower, that there's a place for both. Um, whether that be uh, the, the traditional double deck, where you're not flexible in regards to floor to floor, or even the, the new solution, I think, that uh, is offered by the competition from ourselves, that um, is a flexible solution where you can have varied floor heights. Uh, but I think we've shown with CMA that there's still a place, if you take twin and double deck combined, that you can improve the overall footprint where I think if you used any of the one technology simply by itself, you wouldn't be able to have the space efficiency in the building as what we accomplished as a combined project. So I think a lot of it comes down to the particular building application in regards to which technology is the best use for, for what. Do, so. do all elevator companies offer twin car? No, currently we're the only, uh, Tiss Krupp Elevator is the only company that offers the twin. Um, and I think all of us are offering double deck but um, some in a flexible solution, which I would hand yeah. to Franz, please. Oh, sorry, in my presentation, I'll, I'll discuss when's the best applications for double deck and when are the better, better applications for twin. Uh, I'm not aligned to any of these companies, so I, they, they do have sweet spots in, in the different product selections. Yeah, you really need to look at, you really need to look at um, uh, what the final building should look like, what the traffic flow should be, and based on that, you need to find the optimum on an elevator solution. Whether you do it with double deck, etc., there you really need to, I say, play a, around and find the optimum what the, the customer wants. Sometimes may the, I, the either or the other solution has a bit of advantages, disadvantages, etc. But uh, with double deck, you really can uh, get a lot of things uh, solved. Please, another question. Um, actually, that gentleman just stole my thunder a little bit. I, was, yeah. I had the same question. Um, kind of follow up to that. It's kind of project related. I'm, I have a project similar where we're using double deck elevators. Um, what is your feeling and philosophy on, on um, the user experience of it? Where um, we have clients concerned about, oh, you know, how is the people going to feel in a class A office, for example, where they have to wait for the the upper cap people to disbark and they have to wait kind of that intermediate time. And the part two of that question is also about delivery, you know, uh, lead time to this thing. Is this being made here in China or is it overseas? So I think in general, each company is um, a general putting the systems together here in China for the China market. Uh, in regards to some components, I think we're all dealing with components in a different way. But um, so I don't think delivery is really affected by going to either one of the systems or a destination dispatch system for that standpoint. Is that fair enough, gentlemen? Um, in regards to uh, the first question as far as the people experience with twin, um, I really don't find that it's any different than any other destination dispatch system that they're, they're functioning with. I think a lot of it has to do with determining how you're dealing with the dual exit at the, at the base of the building. Uh, as far as it's dual lobby or if it's combination parking garages, so forth. And then as far as uh, the double deck, I would defer to my colleagues to, to talk specifically about it. I mean, it comes to the point that uh, when you do the, the building layout to, to, to set up the traffic management in the building, then you need con to really consider what the usage is going to be. However, with a uh, modern uh, port or uh, destination control system, you can reconfigure and Normally, this is really not an issue you mentioned. I mean, normally with double deck and uh, 
proper estimation control system, you get rid of the waiting times. So. Hi, um, my question is an extension of the previous two questions. <laughs> how, does a, how does the twin system compare with a super double deck uh, scenario? Well, I'm referring to a scenario where you have different floor to floor heights. Uh, uh, where uh, a, a traditional double-decker double is uh, not feasible. So I guess in this scenario, it's, it's either twin or super double-deck, where, where, uh, where, where the system comes with, uh, 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 what do you call that, uh, height adjustment. So how, how, how do you compare these, these two systems? Well, I think the first question would be just how much floor variability that you're seeing, because um, I think the, even the super double deck, there's some limits in regards to variability, just as there's some limits with twin in regards to building application where it's going to be the better solution or not in regards to traffic handling capacity. We do not see that many adjustable double decks in the market currently, and um, it comes also to the question of weight you move in a shaft and the energy consumption you have also. Uh, Depends on the layout of the building and what is how you how you how you how you plan your building and there plugs in that you in an early stage plan together with an elevator company and take those things into consideration to find really proper solution. I think one clear difference is I mean a double deck whether it be as traditional or a super double deck that's adjustable it's always a double deck in regards to what you're moving. So uh, you see double deck a lot of times focused on express zone type transportation where the twin can actually um, deal with more interfloor traffic cause you're, and you can actually in downtimes park a car. So there is some opportunities there, but it really depends back to, the, to what Franz had said earlier in regards to the people flow within the building and what the building is designed for and how it's flowing people through in regards to locations for cafeterias and, and all. So how many fully occupied buildings in the world uh, that there is that are using double deckers that we can go and you know, see how they operate? Yeah, hundreds for sure. Alone here in China, I mean, we installed... I mean, there's actually one installation very close to here, which is the Shanghai World Financial Center, which is set up with double deck, double deck express shells. I was going to say double deck equipment has been operating for over 40 years. Uh, it's, it's been around since uh, the early 70s, if not even before that. And it's proven performance in the types of buildings they were installed in. I think what really reinvigorated the double deck was destination dispatch <coughs> systems. Mm -hmm. I mean, that really allowed it to re, re, revitalize itself. So. Yep, and there are quite many new projects that are going to be built with double deck. So, uh, for example, in China and uh, uh, in Kuala Lumpur and uh, quite, in quite many places. Yeah, Ping An is also double deck. What's yeah. in there? Yeah. Uh, for the benefit of those of us who are not in vertical transportation business, what are some of the uh, emerging technologies that might help, uh, whether it's increasing efficiency or in any ways, uh, what are new revolutionary ideas that might be on the horizon? <laughs> I'm not going to tell you about what we have. Yeah. <laughs> I say that, that's a difficult question with all of us sitting here at the table. But uh... <laughs> I can meet with you privately. <laughs> Um, I think you've seen examples of where some of the latest ideas are, where we're really all focused on uh, a sustainable approach, regardless of whether it's energy focus, uh, people flow, um, and the various different technologies. And I'm sure we're all uh, focused on you know material, proper and smart materials, reduced weights. Um, it's it's the, the search for the bigger, better, faster, bigger, better, faster mousetrap. Is I would say is the easiest way to state it. Yeah. Just, just come and see the ultra rope uh, in our booth there. So that's one of those that uh, enables something like Kingdom Tower hikes. I was so going to add, uh, similar to that comment, you know, suspension means is an area where there's been a lot of innovation, and I think there will continue to be more innovation there to try and go. And we've had traditional elevator wire ropes for 100 years. And uh, we're now, the comp all of the companies are looking at other means to, uh, other materials and other configurations to use for suspension. So I think going to Franz, the, um, you had talked a bit about the overlay destination dispatch mod approach. 
do you see, and you talked about the improvement in, in the maintaining of the handling capacity during the mod, do you see actually any time difference in regards to a traditional mod versus the, the overlay mod in regards to total project completion time? So is it longer, shorter, roughly the same? Um, the most important thing is when you do um, modernization that you maintain the traffic and do not uh, disturb the traffic flow in the building with a mod. So this is actually the point where you have a huge advantage uh, compared to a conventional controller system to put an overlay over it. And with that, being able to take an op elevator out of operation, have increased traffic performance already compared to uh, uh, the old system so that you can take one after the other elevator out of operation. Whether you do that fast or not, this is a question also what the customer wants, how much space you have to move in the building. Uh, if you uh, do the mod on night shift, for instance, or if you are during the day not on the building, etc. There are also country specific regulations. So when you see conventional mod without uh, an overlay or destination control, you often face issues that during the modernization, and it happened to me uh, early this year in Australia in a quite uh, um, uh, well-known hotel, that they did more than the traffic just collapsed during peak hours. And that you really can avoid. This is really an advantage. And also it's possible, at least with our system, to interface any competitor controller or old outdated controller technology. It's today's state of the art. So you put in really an intelligent system over it and then you also can manage. And you anytime can reconfigure the traffic pattern. This is also something which with conventional system is uh, quite difficult so that you can optimize there. And when you have double decks, of course, when you do double deck modernization, which uh, we have a couple of coming up, uh, compared to conventional, you there also immediately have uh, much better traffic performance. So I think you could say the key would be that it doesn't matter how long you're in the building when you're not impacting the building, other than costs. But it gives you at least the flexibility around really working with the schedules and uh, having no impact to the building. So you don't have to rush through a mod to try to limit your impact to the building, which is very positive. Yeah, you have to really plan it properly and then it... Uh... You talked about the jump lift in regards to the improvement it makes for the traffic flow for the workers. Um, but obviously there's a time period where you need to move the jump lift in regards to the different stages. Roughly how long does it take to move the jump lift elevator system to the next level or stage within the building, do you find? Uh, that's, that's pretty fast, so it, it can be done pretty much uh, in night time, or at, at least uh, during weekend. So, uh, so it, it should, shouldn't uh, then interfere the building, building itself or the construction process. Uh, my question is to Jenny for regarding this jump lift. What will be the additional cost if we go with respect to conventional installation? Um, so... Some rule, <laughs> just percentage yes, wise. Let's yeah. say cost, cost issues is not my, my field actually, but, but anyway, the jump lift is, is this... Um, it's, it's going to be the final lift. So in that sense, uh, most of it is, is already paid. Uh, when it's uh, taken in, but it's only taken into account during the construction time. But if I remember correctly, for something like 80% of the materials uh, are reused in the final, so it might be something like 20% more, uh, more to that uh, that price uh, uh, to to replace the, these components that that cannot be used in the final elevator. Thank you. Yes, I'm uh, Johannes de Jong, Head of Technology from uh, Kone, uh, and I have a comment on the jump lift here as well. Uh, <laughs> jump lift, yes, we talk about costs. It's actually what is your total cost. If you can increase your construction period by approximately, or improve your uh, construction period by approximately 20%, make your efficient construction time 20% more efficient, uh, you will find that, for example, in, in, in high-rise buildings, for example, like Shanghai Tower, where they haven't used it, uh, for example, you could have saved, uh, you could have made, gained 
about half a million dollars every single day you're ready earlier. Do that over four months and make your calculations once again. <laughs> Thank you. Marina Bay Sands, 13 jump lifts uh, to get it four months quicker. Yeah, and uh, that's 13. That's the biggest jump lift site in the world. It was a casino. They made hundreds of millions of dollars in those three, four months we were ready earlier. Not only that, Marina Bay Sands was a very special building. When they built it, it was built under a bow. So we had to start the jump lift under a bow, and then the building straightened when they put on the roof. Yeah, uh, we did that. It was under a bill, under a, as long as you know how the building is going to behave, no worries. You just follow it and get it right. And uh, when the building settled, one realignment afterwards, and you have a nice riding elevator again. Thank you. Yeah, I can, I mean, uh, the basis of um, going to a concept such as jump lift really doesn't add any additional challenges to rail straightness as you're going through a high-rise high building than, let's say, a traditional method. So um, there's no, no added or compounding. In fact, in fact, some could even say that it uh, actually improves the situation depending on the rail alignment, me alignment method you're using. I have a question on the jump lift. We had a <coughs> excuse me, project in the U.S. where the uh, elevator inspector said it wasn't very practical because he was going to insist that every time you jumped it, you had to do a new full Re load, full speed safety and buffer test. Have you run up against that? Um, well, I haven't, but maybe Johannes can comment also <laughs> this one. I said, I, I can actually answer that. Yes. We, as an industry, we have. Yeah. I can confirm we have a similar concept, maybe a couple of other patents. We also uh, do a climb lift, similar, quite similar solution. Uh, we did such buildings, no issue. You go through the normal acceptance testing, that works well, well no. Okay, again, I'm there. Sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> we have the first and only jump lift, actually, at the moment in North America running. Uh, it's certified. Uh, this system is certified in such a way that we have to do a full safety test, of course, in the beginning. But when we go up, as we go up, we don't need to redo them every single time, and we don't need to redo every single uh, test again for the approval, which makes the process much easier so that you can actually really hand over the elevator within maybe three to four hours, maybe even a day, yeah, depending on how high you go. But, uh, but that will absolutely reduce uh, your, your, your time lost during the transfer, uh, transfer when you really make the jump to the higher floors. Uh, it's a question of having your system certified, we all have, we have all our systems certified uh, by authorized bodies both in the U.S. and in, uh, in, in Europe and then in some other countries around uh, uh, Southeast Asia where you have to do it separately again. Thank you. I don't disagree, but at the same time I would say it's still jurisdictional dependent because um, I think all of us have different products and they're all certified, but whether or not a jur jurisdiction accepts that certification is a different topic. And that's, uh, that's, the that's, one particular jurisdiction I'm referencing, I know that all of us um, approached a jump lift concept and none of us were able to get through without having to deal with the uh, recertification and therefore they didn't go with the project actually of using a jump lift concept. So um, it's, it's a jurisdictional dependent issue which is more prevalent I think in North America than you'll see in other parts of the world. On twin, every twin job I've seen that you guys have laid out, you insist on having a single deck as part of the group. Is that, is that still the case? And if so, why so? Uh, we do not need always a single deck car within a twin group. We can do it like, uh, like double decks. Yeah, you always have two cars within one shop. So this is not a requirement. I think in the beginning it was uh, being pushed. But as we've become uh, broader in the application with different building opportunities, um, we've not necessarily now made that a requirement. So it just really depends on the building layout and the traffic flow and the, the use case. So. I think there was maybe also a, a misunderstanding. We did a lot of comparisons of handling capacity in, in local groups and very often sure twin against double deck with double entrance situation. And what we can say is really that in 90% of, of the cases, if we have a group, for example, of six twins compared to six double deck, we reached better performance, which means we could run in six shafts one car less. Now, this is also a question of energy saving and material saving, so we could offer maybe five twins plus one single deck and still reach the same performance. This is in very much of the cases uh, was the result. Actually, what, what I have seen, it's, it's usually so that uh, double deck is slightly 
better, but it always depends how you run the traffic. So you need to be very careful in this analysis. I think the positive is that through uh, a lot of focus from all the competitors in the industry in regards to dispatching algorithms, there's a lot of progress made where um, the fact is the, the varying difference between the, the group isn't as significant as it used to be, which is positive for the, uh, for the building industry. So. With all these various manufacturers here, can you and the uh, advent <laughs> of the permanent magnet motors, the largest that you have? Can you tell us what your upper duty is, speed and capacity on each machine? I think we are doing 50 meters per second now, Johannes put it, so, yep. And that's it, it makes 100, which is the largest of our machine. Uh, 4,000 kilos at least, five. And say on our side, we, um, current machine in production is 13 meters per second, and that's doing, uh, uh, actually 8,000 kilos, I believe, at the 13 meters per second. So we can actually do two double deck, or a, a double deck system at that. And then we have developments to continue on to the 15 meter per second as well. Yeah. I, I think I can just quickly answer, because I've seen in the booth, you're 13 meters per second right now, and 15 meter per second coming soon is what the booth said. But uh, I know there's a presentation this, I know the presentation this week as well about the opportunities that Otis is bringing to the table. Currently, we also work on a couple of projects. There is working process, so basically, uh, we need to match customer specifications, and there uh, you are above 10 meters, around 10 meters, and uh, on the load. But we uh, depends also on the high, etc. We are able to yeah. to match competition, or have a couple of projects where we also behind. So we are all working on the same level, but there's a lot of working process. Um, what's coming on next. I think what's clear, I think all of us are in um, continuing to push in regards to permanent magnet motor technology for high efficiency, smaller machines for, for high rise application. Uh, my question is to David. Uh, in the case of emergency, the real problem many times is really panic mode. Mm -hmm. You refer to it briefly, but do you think an additional research would be helpful in that regard? I think we could benefit from some, um, this is what I mentioned right at the very end, and uh, it was running out of time. I think we could benefit from more research into human factors considerations. Um, the panic is an issue, uh, especially with a new types of system, like we have, uh, you know, with this OEO operation has been available uh, uh, now, since the, t the publication of the, the 2013 code, but there's no building operating with it yet. So we, we still um, don't really know how it's going to work. There are other buildings with other systems that are similar or have um, evacuation concepts that uh, use a similar approach, but nothing identical to that. Um, so, uh, you know, the, the research, I think, would, would be beneficial and also... Uh, trying different combinations. You know, I gave one example of a 47-story building, but we could look at other uh, types of buildings, mixed-use occupancies, uh, different sizes, to, uh, and run simulations on those to see what, what the uh, benefits of different approaches would be. As I understand it, this is similar to what's in the existing uh, International Building Code, except for your designation of the five floors. And, of course, in that code, they were saying the reason for doing this self-evacuation elevator is just to reduce one of the required service elevators. Do you have a similar requirement for this? No. Um, <clears throat> in the International Building Code, there's a requirement for when you uh, get to a 420-foot high building, you require three stairwells. Uh, if you provide occupant evacuation elevators, not to be confused with occupant evacuation operation, which is defined in the elevator code, uh, then you're allowed to reduce the number of stairwells back to the traditional two. Uh, so the, but there's no provision in the elevator code to reduce stairwells. The other question I had is how do you stop People who get on an elevator, how do you stop them from holding the doors? Do you jump out the doors? Do you force close the doors? What do you do? 
Uh, well, that's, I did mention that we, part of our uh, approach was that we thought wardens would be uh, appropriate to have, that uh, training is important, uh, drills are important, uh, so we need to educate the tenants and, uh, and have wardens there to help uh, shepherd them in and prevent things like that happening. Yeah, it's a, I think it will be a question of time, Jim, before people have the confidence that this system will work. Uh, I mentioned it's a whole new paradigm, so the, I can't you know, overemphasize the importance of the, the training, the drills, the uh, use of wardens, the use of signage and, uh, and voice uh, announcements to help it all work together. Eliminating uh, elevator shafts in these high-rise buildings and changing to different elevators. and uh, Is any of that happening around the world? And it seems like a very difficult space to uh, make better use of. That's true. Yeah, that is true. A lot of the time it's, it's, it's in a core space, not, not premium space. It's sort of, um, But there is, it's still space and it's still rentable space if you can work out how to use it. So are there some buildings that are con uh, eliminating their elevator shafts? Oh, yeah, these technologies are being designed all the time around the world. Double-deck elevators are, are becoming common. One of the reasons I, I put up that demonstration is that the elevator companies are really good at telling you about the technologies, but not, not always so good at telling you about what the benefits can be. Um, and and uh, there are some real benefits in in narrowing cores and making them smaller. Is there any requirement for the material used for installation inside the hoistway, like driving cables or uh, wiring and so on, with a special fire rating and so on? Because maybe you have, will have the situation that you have to pass a heated area. How if this is monitored already? Is something in the code? The, uh, the hoistway uh, structural integrity, integrity requirements and fire ratings are all in the building code. Uh, what we have based our assumptions on is, is two-hour protection, which is a typical what you'd get anyway. The wiring, uh, if it's outside the hoistway, then would need to be protected in an enclosure or use special two-hour wiring. Um, the uh, Entrances are already available uh, to provide that you know hour and a half, two hour rating, and uh, but there are no other special uh, fire ratings required. Actually, I have one quick one for you, David. Um, first of all, I'm, I want to congratulate the committee for coming as far as they did because I remember when this started back and when I was still in standards as well. So that's uh, great to see the the, the progress. Um, along with that progress uh, with OEO operation, was it conceived? I mean, if we look at some of the examples we've seen today from all of us as well as from um, consultant authorities showing that they have unique configurations of lift application, has that been considered or modeled within OEO to this point? When we first started our hazard analysis, we started out with a sort of typical high-rise office building. Uh, when we concluded the hazard analysis and all of our recommendations, we went back through it for different types of occupancies, uh, unique configurations, and uh, we ended up concluding that there really wasn't much to, that, that needed to be changed in our, uh, in our proposals to, to accommodate different types of buildings. The only thing is we do recommend that a, that a building do a risk analysis of their particular situation, their design, and, and see if there are any special considerations that need to be taken into account. Do you see expertise out in the industry in regards to facilitate those risk analysis now? Yes, uh, there are standards that uh, tell you how to do risk analysis, ISO standards. Uh, actually, I chair a committee that wrote a, a risk assessment standard at ISO, uh, but uh, the, and the hazard analysis uh, uh, process uh, that we used is defined by ASME. So that there's uh, plenty of documentation on how to conduct the analysis, and I think there's enough people out there that can do it. Yeah, hi, David. Just an update on the work ISO's been doing on evacuation and the comparisons between what's been done with the OEO arrangement and what ISO's doing. 
All right, there's, a, there's an ISO technical committee, uh, TC178, which is responsible for uh, lifts and, uh, and escalators and related equipment, and they have a working group, working group six, which has done uh, risk assessment on issues pertaining to building emergencies. And uh, I think about three years ago, they published a, uh, a report on what all of the uh, the issues are, and uh, they, you know, both the elevator issues and the building issues that need to be addressed by buildings. Uh, subsequent to that report being published, that working group has worked on addressing uh, the, the specific lift uh, issues and is going to be publishing a technical specification on how those issues uh, should be addressed. It's not written in the, in the same way as the uh, occupant evacuation operation is written. It's not as specific, uh, but it, it doesn't conflict. I, should, I guess I'll put it that way. It has a similar sort of recommended operation, uh, but it's more general, more broad, uh, because it's, you know, it's an ISO specification, a technical specification, not a code. Uh, yeah, this question is for David. Uh, I would like to know, since uh, you're introducing the OAE, uh, oh, sorry, OEO, so meaning that this passenger lift will be using as an evacuation during the fire. My question is, uh, will the surrounded area, meaning the lobby lift and the, the door lift, is it have to be fire rated? Or is it like a lobby have to be pressurized to protect the people inside the lobby, something like that? Um, our analysis assumed that you would have the, the proper uh, fire rating of the lobbies, uh, uh, the doors the, in the area around you know, the elevator lobbies, and pressurization as well. Now, the building code doesn't require pressurization. If you have enclosed lobbies, you don't need to pressurize according to the building code. Uh, but uh, again, if you did that, if you just did enclosed lobbies without pressurization, then you need to make sure it has the proper fire rating. And that's all specified in the building code. And it's a, basically a two-hour rating. Uh, as the elevator speeds are increasing, and eventually I assume in another 10 or 20 years, there may be 30 meters per second or whatever. Uh, are you considering a effect uh, of that speed on a human beings? Because when I ride super fast elevators, my ears and my knees are affected very quickly. So do you give a consideration to that? That's one question. Second is I know today we were mostly talking about high-rise buildings, but the public transportation system these days is getting extremely long and horizontal. It is almost like high, super high-rise buildings laid on the ground horizontally. Are you giving consideration to the transportation system, horizontal, I would call it a horizontal transportation system because this, those, uh, wall, uh, you know, the, the, uh, the escalators or whatever, uh, the other walkways, you know, they're so slow, you know, compared to what the, what the airports require you to travel to catch a flight, you know. Whatever you do, the passenger needs to have a certain comfort, and there is certainly a trade-off, and uh, certainly uh, investigation going to the, that direction. However, we also need to be aware that not every elevator uh, needs to go at 50 meters per second, because you have intermediate stop, interfloor traffic, etc. so you really need to know what the traffic pattern you want to, with what traffic pattern you want to solve your traffic flow in a building. Certainly express elevators can consider, but uh, at the moment we stick to 10 meters, maybe a little bit more, but that's it. However, analysis and uh, research goes in such a direction, it's clear, but whether it's going to be applied commercially in wide, wide uh, range, that's question mark. At the moment, most of the buildings are built still with eight, ten meters, even below. Uh, you have something further, please? 
Yeah. So uh, for that kind of high speed elevators, you need to have broad pressurization of the cabin. So, for example, is uh, high speed, uh, the highest his speed at the moment, 70 meters per second in Taipei uh, 101. Uh, it has pressurization, and uh, uh, there's also quite old research, I think, uh, that showed that uh, human air can can stand something like 20, uh, 12 meters per second uh, naturally. So, but beyond that that limit, you need some, something like uh, pressurization. And, and um, so obviously you need something to take care of that. I think the pressurization solution has limitations as well. Uh, you know, it, it's been tried. There's an example, but. Yeah, at, at some point, you've got to get out of that pressurization and just get, you know, walk out into the atmosphere, and you, you, the human ear has to adjust, and uh, there there are limitations on how fast it can do that. So I, I don't know what the solution is, and we may have elevators that go, you know, 20 meters per second up, but 10 meters per second down to accommodate the ear. Yeah, agreed. The um 12 meters per second is what a healthy ear can withstand. Um, it's a particular sensitive topic for me because I have a damaged ear, and so 9 meters per second is about the point of what I can stand comfortably or I stepped out of the cabin uh, a bit dazed and in and, and pain. So um, there's ways to compensate it in regards to pressurization, but the reality is if we talk about speed, it really gets to a point of diminishing return in regards to increased speeds. And I think, Franz, you hit the point where when you start looking at mixed-use buildings and some of the different aspects, that speed isn't always the answer. Um, in regards to the second topic, where we're obviously increasing the throughput in regards to uh, vertical transportation, it puts demands on the horizontal transportation. And there's a concept that's um, uh, being worked on that's uh, considered to be the last, model, the last mile uh, scenario where um, metros and a lot of the transportation systems today could have a, f a faster and more throughput in regards to the handling capacity if you could connect the last mile in regards to the radius of the neighborhoods using those facilities. And um, that's something that uh, I can only say that stay tuned in regards to some activities here in the next uh, four to five weeks of some products that will look at how to accelerate and have better throughput of horizontal transportation. Uh, it is observed always that your shaft sizes and number of persons are always differing from company to company. Now, is it going to be some kind of standardized standardization possible where uh, even the shaft sizes are standardized and even the number of passengers carried in the elevator would be standardized, which could be beneficial to the designers where they can refer to one shaft sizes? Yeah, I think, um, I mean, I'll answer that maybe in a little bit different way. Once upon a time in North America, they had uh, a very standardized layout footprint situation. And quite honestly, everybody kind of adhered to that and really didn't focus things on a system optimization standpoint. And so it was kind of a component business. And that's changed. And um, for sure, there's some that can fit in others' hoistways and vice versa. But it, uh, I think... Well, it may make some complexity in regards to equipment selection. Um, at the same time, it's driving innovation and it's driving the shaft efficiency and, and it's pushed some of the gains that you've been able to see here today over the last 10 years with the change and transition from a component focus to a system focus. So it's, um, let's say it's good and bad in regards to standardization. Um, I don't see standardization any time in the near future simply because the innovation model is still running aggressively in regards to us. I don't know if you guys see it the same way or not. Yeah. I, um, there, there are a couple of different standards in existence already. There, as Patrick uh, mentioned, there is a, a North American standard. It's called NEI-1. It's published by the, uh, the Industry Association, NEI. And uh, it does have all st standardized uh, hoistway sizes, uh, machine room sizes, and, and so on. Uh, the thing is, it's not mandatory. It's, it's just a guide. Uh, there's also an ISO standard for uh, standardized car sizes and, uh, and also machine rooms and things like that and standardized duties. Uh, again, it's not mandatory. So it's, it's simply a guide. And 
By the way, that's being updated in the near future to include machine roomless elevators because the, currently that standard doesn't include machine roomless equipment. Uh, but even when that's done, none of those will be mandatory. So it's, it tends not to be made mandatory because it's not a safety issue. You know, we, codes focus on safety, whereas size standardization is more of a competitive issue. And, Therefore, there's no there's no drive to standardize. Yeah, but what what has been observed is that there is very marginal change in the shaft sizes, and uh, maybe six inches here and there. So um, I thought that there could be a possibility of getting it to that uh, level where it is easy for any uh, car elevator, uh, sorry, any uh, lift or vertical transmission vendors to look at the sizing. That's where, and even for the high rises, there would be issue with the leveling and the uh, overall uh, getting everything in the level because they are high rises. So from that point of view, I wanted to understand that is it po possible to standardize the shaft sizes and the number of uh, passengers traveling? That's that's it. Fully hear what you're saying, and I think that was one of the points of why we needed to have the dialogue today to say is there guidelines and we can help uh, participate in and publish for tall buildings council in regards to that topic but um, at the same time I would say there is a way to do it in regards to looking at everything in a worst case scenario but then there's always going to be innovation to continue to push an improvement over that so I think um, I've seen another couple questions and just to just to make sure everybody's aware we can now go into the dialogue further and the questions are clearly open to all of us so please uh, please carry on sorry one more question for David um, about the the OEO operation so that was developed with the a17 committees but the majority of the super tall buildings are not in any place that's covered by a17 one they're all covered by the EN standard codes um, is there any work or move to integrate that OEO operation into the European code committees uh, with their very different uh, scenarios for fire elevators and firefighters lifts in high-rise buildings uh, I can comment <clears throat> from, an, uh, I guess, a, more of an ISO viewpoint than EN. Um, I don't participate on, an, on the EN81 uh, committees, but I uh, do uh, interact with many people who do uh, at ISO because we, we interact there. And we do share our experiences. Uh, we have worked, as I mentioned in the, uh, the answer to uh, Steve's question uh, about ISO activities, we are sharing our experiences from, from North America and Asia and, and Europe. Uh, and uh, it's probably a long way off, but I think eventually we, we could end up with one worldwide standard at some point. Uh, but it's going to take a while. Uh, but um, there is input being given from you know, what we've done in OEO to uh, our colleagues from Europe and Asia. And uh, there's, a lot of, there's been a lot of interest uh, in uh, what we've done in North America. So I, I think they'll be looking at it. Yeah, I think, um, if, correct me if I'm wrong, I know there's a few experts in the room that sit on the EN standards, but uh, for today there's a lot of input and exchange, but there's no current activity in regards to changing or creating a different uh, operation, is correct? Uh, in the northern China, the elevator has a chimney effect. The chimney effect in the northern part of China uh, will help or hinder in, during the crisis. In the winter time, in uh, the chimney effect in the elevator can be a serious issue. It can be a negative pressure. So there will be a lot of currents, and there are a lot of wind that will all enter into the, uh, uh, the stairwells. And there's a problem we cannot solve. So how can you deal with this in the northern part? Uh, in an escape model to guarantee that the stairwell is a safe area to escape. So I'll, I'll try to answer a little bit. Uh, I'm not a pressurization expert or a building expert, but from some of the discussions we've had in our task groups about pressurization, uh, it's critical that it be balanced throughout the building. It's also critical if you're going to pressurize um, either the hoistway or a stairwell that's, that's connected, that you need to also pressurize the lobbies. Uh, if you get a, a pressure differential... Uh, between the hoistway and the lobby, then you could have problems uh, with doors being hung up, not, not being able to close. So our, the recommendations in our proposal in the appendix 
state that when pressurization is, is done, it should be uh, the hoistway, the, the stairwell, and the elevator lobby so that it's equivalent. And then it needs to be balanced you know, throughout the height of the building. For the 101 Taipei, uh, maybe a question to Jean and uh, Glenn. Uh, just want to ask about the uh, G-force uh, effect. Whether this 17 meter per second, this pressurization will reduce this uh, G-force effect, or is there any kind of mechanical uh, system or uh, engineering something to reduce this? G-force effect. Thank you. Well, it, it's addressed with the, with the pressurisation of the car at the moment. Um, is there an alternative system? I, I'm not sure what, what alternative we could offer up, whether our, our colleagues have an alternative arrangement. But certainly the G-forces are a difficult thing to deal with at those sort of speeds. I think oh, uh, maybe he's talking about the stack effect. Yeah, I was, saying, I was, what I was wondering. Yeah. I mean, in regards to stack effect, in regards to um, uh, having the pressurization issue in regards to high-speed cars running up, it comes down to your uh, shaft ratio in regards to looking at airflow, how the cabin's designed in regards to handling that airflow, and then as well, um, you, you do have to deal with pressurization between hoistways. Maybe you don't necessarily have vents to the outside, but you clearly need to have a... Uh, uh, a connection between hoistways where you can essentially deal with the stack or a piston effect where the cars, as they're running up and down, are creating air pressurization at the top or the bottom. Yeah, the, the high-speed elevators in Type A 101 are, are shaped like a submarine. They've got shrouds on the top and the bottom, as do all of the real high-speed observatory lifts. They're all made that way. I'd say I think everyone at 10 meters per second is pretty much doing uh, aerodynamic and uh, airflow studies in regards to their equipment to, to properly manage the tops and bottoms of the, of the cabins to, 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 for the proper shapes. Do you think we need to go further in regards to publishing a guideline of how to properly deal with transportation issues in tall buildings? Earlier, let's say the minority only said yes. But I uh, believe that after this discussion, I am begged to ask the question again. So from your opinion in the audience, if I could see a show of hands, who feels that publishing a guideline would actually be an important thing going forward for tall buildings? Please raise your hand. 